Hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, as you can see, I'm not a specialist in anything maybe. Um, the opportunity to speak here uh, is something I'm very grateful for. Uh, I'll actually start sharing my screen, sorry. Uh, share this. So I hope you can see the, uh, the presentation now. <clears throat> and I hope you can hear me, obviously. So um, I wanted today to uh, give a kind of bird's eye view uh, of a topic that I've been working on from different angles in Prajnana Karagupta's work. Uh, I simply titled, titled this as Simple Cognitions. It's uh, mainly about the section in Prajnana Karagupta's philosophical system uh, of how cognitions of different kinds work together to constitute everyday activity. The basic uh, outline of what I'm going to say and the, on which I'll try to guide you through this topic uh, is this. So I'm going to start by saying a little bit about the simple cognitions uh, after introducing Prajnakaragupta a little bit. Um, and we'll talk about the, talk a bit about the tradition in which Prajnakaragupta uh, wrote his text. Then I'll say a few words about the cognition of the linga, which is a technical term for the reason properties. So this is an element of inferential cognition. And then say something about perceptions, inferences, and habits, and how these three uh, elements or atoms fit together. Again, the main point of these two middle sections is just to give you uh, an idea of how I think uh, Prajnakara Gupta positions himself within the tradition of Dhammakirti's uh, philosophy. And to some extent, um, provides an interesting model, uh, syst a very systematic account of uh, certain elements in Dhammakirti's theory. Um, and then I'll just conclude. So basically three steps and then we're at the end, quite simple, I hope. So let's start by looking at simple cognitions after we've uh, come to grips with who Prajnakara Gupta is. Um, he's an, a Buddhist who lived in India between 750 and 900 uh, of the common era. He is from Northern India, either from Kashmir or from Bengal area. There are different accounts, but apparently no, no, no association with South India. Um, according to Tibetan accounts, mostly Taranata, he is a layman, so not a monk. Uh, he is best known to us, or scholars of Buddhist philosophy, at least, um, as the author, author of the Pramana Vatika, Adam Karabashya. The text whose title is a bit tricky. Sometimes it's just called Pramana Vatika Alamkara, sometimes Pramana Vatika Bashya. Um, but I chose this uh, today. That's also what you find in the manuscript. This work is an extensive commentary, a uh, really massive commentary on three of four chapters in Dhammakirti's Pramana Vatika. Dhammakirti um, is more or less the founder of this tradition together with Dignaga, who he um, reformulates largely. Uh, and Prajnakara Gupta comments on what many think is Dhammakirti's major work, the Pramana Vatika. He comments on three chapters here, on the Pramana city chapter, the overall aim of which is to establish the Buddha as a Pramana, as a kind of reliable cognition, which Prajnakara Gupta takes very literally, maintaining that Buddha is actually the main kind of reliable cognition, his essence is cognition. And uh, this already characterizes him, Prajnakara Gupta's uh, project 
in a certain way, uh, quite strongly biased towards this chapter. Then he wrote a commentary on the Pratyaksha chapter, the chapter uh, on perception. This is going to be the main source for what I'm going to say today. Uh, he also commented on the last chapter in the Pramanavatika, which is the chapter on the inference for the sake of others, the Parata Anumana Paricheda. And he did not comment on the first chapter, the Swarta Anumana chapter, or what is traditionally held to be the Swarta Anumana, uh, the first chapter, the inference for one's own, own sake. Dhamma, this is the only chapter that Dhammakirti had himself composed a commentary on. Prajakara Gupta is uh, influential uh, in certain respects. He clearly influenced the circle of scholars around Chnana Shri Mitra uh, a few centuries later in Vikramashila, a large Buddhist uh, monastery, monastic university. Uh, and Chnana Shri Mitra there refers to Prajnakara Gupta as the main authority after Dhammakirti always on the Chitra Advaita Vada, the theory that uh, cognition has an object which is uh, variegated Chitra yet non-dual. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Prajnakara Gupta also was discussed and criticized of course by non-Buddhists and the earliest one we to receive him and to quote him uh, seems to have been Basa Vajna in his Nyaya Bhushana. So uh, he's a Nyayika. <clears throat> That's perhaps enough to uh, about the historic context. I'd also like to highlight here uh, some modern and perhaps not so modern scholarship uh, on Prajnakara Gupta. There is a famous distinction uh, that Skarpatsky made, uh, where he distinguishes three schools in the Pramana tradition. This differentiation of three schools is, I think it's fair to say, still uh, valid today, even though I think nobody would follow Skarpatsky in all its details or agree with all the reasons that he had for making this distinction. But it's a, it's a distinction that is not without a basis, let's say. So the first school that Shabatsky distinguishes is that of the philological school of commentators. Uh, these are authors who commented on Dhammakirti's work and mainly, mainly with the intention of uh, providing a word by word commentary without expanding too much uh, on philosophical speculation. At least this is how Shabatsky saw it, and that's certainly true for several of the commentaries that survive. More interestingly for us today are the other two schools, the first of which is the Kashmir or philosophic uh, school of commentators, uh, where, of which Damotra is the main proponent. Damotra is another uh, scholar, Buddhist philosopher, who received Dhammakirti's ideas. He wrote his works before Prajnakara Gupta, probably at the same time as uh, Kamalashila and Shantarakshita in Madhyamaka, Pramana, Vadins, uh, were active. And he, Prajnakara Gupta opposes Dhammakirti on certain points. Dhammakirti is also often recognized as uh, the first major philosophical fourth force after Dhammakirti. <clears throat> um, the third group that Shabatsky distinguishes is the religious school of commentators. This is Prajnakara Gupta's school. The, as I mentioned, for Prajnakara Gupta, the most important uh, part of Dhammakirti's Pramanavatika is the Pramana City chapter, the chapter where the Buddha is proven to be a means of valid cognition. And uh, this is part of the reason that Shabatsky, I think, called this the religious school of commentators. Now, not really as a result of that, but at least in line with uh, Shabatsky's analysis or distinction, 
uh, Dharmakirti was often read through the lens of Dhammatara. So through the uh, comments or developments, let's say, re-elaborations of the, uh, the second school. Um, typically, we will find that uh, the Hetu Bindu, Nyaya Bindu, and Pramana Vinishchaya would be commented on by proponents of the philosophical school. Uh, and the Pramana Vatika would typically be commented on by the other two, and especially by the religious school of commentators. So Prajnakara Gupta commented on the Pramana Vatika. What's interesting or significant perhaps about this is that the Vatika is uh, more experimental in certain ways, or uh, contains theories which are not discussed in the Pramana Vinishchaya, nor in the Hitu Bindu and Nyaya Bindu. Hitu Bindu and Nyaya Bindu are really uh, works of, of logic, uh, and the Pramana Vinishchaya is a general account, but does not contain certain important, or does not contain certain theories which are important to the Pramana Vatika. For example, uh, the Chitra Advaita theory which I mentioned is hardly present in the Pramana Vinishchaya, uh, and also the discussion of uh, the Buddha as a Pramana, as a means of valid cognition, so precisely the topic that Prajnakara Gupta took to be the main <laughs> project in the Pramana Vatika, is not there really in much detail. On the other hand, and as a caution, uh, showing the limits of this categorization, one topic that is also absent in the Pramana Vinishchaya is the theory of exclusion, a poha, and that's precisely where the Motara wrote a standalone treatise on. So even though it was a topic from the Pramana Vatika, it was recepted and received and uh, elaborated on by the Motara. So these two points are really correlates. I'm not trying to say that there is a close uh, relation between them, they're just observations. But the reason I'm saying this is that perhaps this way of, or in this situation, it's possible that certain avenues of interpretation, let's say, have been missed for Dharmakirti's work. So I'm not trying to say that uh, Dharmakirti was misunderstood or something like that. Uh, it's just that possible other interpretations might not have been so obvious. Just to give you one example, uh, this is a small quote from Dreyfus uh, on Dhammakirti's account of everyday activity as based on reliable cognitions, which is also the topic that we're going to focus on in a moment. And Dreyfus says with my emphasis added, quote, I show that given Dhammakirti's theory of perception, it is difficult and yet necessary to exclude memory from the sphere of validity. Perception in isolation cannot provide useful knowledge unless it is supplemented by perceptual judgments, which are nothing but memories induced by previous experiences. Hence, memory is necessary to perception, and yet it is not valid." End of quote. So this is really, um, I think, a general assessment, uh, which is presents a theory in Dhammakirti, uh, which to some extent uh, has features, as I'll show later, uh, that mainly derive from Dhammotara, Dhammotara's interpretation of Dhammakirti's work. Dhammotara is here the gold standard, particularly I'd like to say uh, the necessity of uh, excluding memory and things like that, and this simple one of the simple cognitions from the sphere of validity, so from being means of valid cognition in and of themselves. This is often called uh, the perceptual judgment, the judgment following perception and allowing a, which helps perception fulfill a certain function, but is not itself as important or great cognition as perception. Um, and the main argument that the Motara brings in his um, elaboration again and again of, of Dhammakirti's theory is that this perceptual judgment or these small auxiliary cognitions uh, can't be pramanas, can't be pramanas uh, 
because they grasp what has already been grasped. They don't show a new object. Now, in order to understand this properly, we need to know how Damakirti uh, characterizes validity or what it is to be a means of valid cognition. And here he has two uh, criteria. Avisamvadana, so that the cognition uh, must be not, or must not be lie, must be reliable, it's often just a synonym of this, or th that it shows you an object which has not yet been cognized or which is not yet known. So it must show you a new object. Now, Damotara's usage of Krihita Grahana, of this idea that grasping something that has already been grasped uh, is obviously in line with the second uh, criterion that Damakirti here mentions. By the way, this criterion is uh, also accepted by the Mimonses and my teacher Helmut Kasser uh, has, I think, quite thoroughly shown that Damakirti here adopts a Mimonsaka um, criterion and shows how it fits into his system. But it's not so important. Important is that the notion of Krihita Grahana mainly serves as an as a negative criterion. It excludes conventional cognitions or memories, things like that. And it restricts pramanya to cognitions of an unknown particular. So that for Dhammakirti, only inference and perception are actually means of valid cognition. Uh, in later interpretations, starting soon after Dhammakirti, well, at least with Dhammakirti's analysis, pramanya is uh, analyz analyzed also as the capacity for activity that leads to the attainment of a certain goal or object. Um, <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, I referred before to Helmut's work also, uh, he would like to quote him here. I have not yet been able to locate a passage in Dharmakirti's works where the validity of perception or inference is derived in terms of Ajnata Arta Prakasha. So this second criterion, uh, even that is used mainly in a negative, uh, as a means of excluding things. So if you, the cognition doesn't fill the, fulfill this criterion, it gets disqualified as a uh, pramana. This is an idea that is not all that prominent in Dhammakirti. For example, it occurs at the beginning of the Pramana uh, city chapter in the Pramana Vatika. So already in a text which is typically uh, grouped in the uh, favorite of the religious school of commentators, if you follow uh, Shabatsky's phrase. Um, and here, cognition that concerns the conventional sphere is not assumed to be a means of valid cognition, we have to add, because it grasps what has already been grasped. The locus classicus is maybe in the Hetupindu uh, for this, uh, where he said, Tamakirti says that remembering smriti or cognition assisted by memory is not a means of valid cognition uh, because anadikata vasturupa anadikate, because again, this is a different formulation, it doesn't cognize uh, a real thing that is not yet known. Um, <clears throat> then again, in the Vinishchaya, there is a passage that Birgit Kellner in an article from 2004 already has drawn attention to, and there too, the idea is, leads to a negative uh, statement. So I think it's still true what Krasa said in 2001, that the Krihita Grahana or Ajnata Arta Prakasha, it's positive formulation, uh, are not um, criteria that fully characterize an insufficient cognition. Now, the situation changes quite a lot uh, with Damotara. He uh, says, or tells us, that perceptual judgment uh, is necessary for any pramana in order to enable activity. It becomes a systematic requirement in Dhammatara's work. Uh, 
this might be one reason why uh, Abhinava Gupta, for example, says that uh, pramanya, or attributes this idea that pramanya validity depends on determination of Yavasaya, uh, which McCree has drawn attention to and found that Abhinava Gupta attributes this position to Dhamotra. A second point that's important for Dhamotra is that perception, since it isn't conceptual, since it isn't uh, a, a cognition that can be as expressed in words, uh, cannot ascertain anything. And thirdly, that conceptual cognition after perception is needed. Because in order to be pravataka, uh, you need a conceptual cognition since ascertainment uh, is the condition for a cognition being able to cause activity, mostly, not in every case, but mostly. Um, Krahita Grahana is then usually brought up by Damotra as the main reason for excluding conceptual cognition. So the problems he gets into with this line of argument are that he comes very, very close to saying that Pratyaksha has a, the nature of a, of a uh, determination and that it might even be conceptual uh, because not because he thinks that it, perception actually contains a conceptual feature, but because it's so closely vetted and so dependent on the following conceptual cognition. And if it were fully independent uh, of the Vikalpa, then the consequence for the Motra would be that it's actually not a Pramana in and of itself. <clears throat> Prajnakara Gupta differs very strongly from the Motra on this issue. He shuns uh, the systematic requirement of Grahita Grahana arguments and tries to really get around them. So, uh, and tries to avoid them as much as possible. Uh, that's at least my impression. And in order to do that, he has to give a different account of how pramana causes activity. So he cannot, like the motra, maintain this idea that it's always dependent on uh, ascertainment. In doing this, I think Prajnakara Gupta affords us uh, a different view a different avenue, or gets us on a different avenue of interpretation of uh, Dhammakirti's works. And in the following, I'd like to show two examples uh, of how he gets around this requirement of Krahita Grahana and what he actually, so and show you some systematic aspects of his work, which I think are there in order to enable Prajnakara Gupta to maintain this position. So the Pramanavati Kalam Karabashi, as I said, is a huge work. Um, and I've only worked on a small uh, segment of it, a few pages in the end, a few dozen pages. Um, so I would like to also draw your attention to the recent work by uh, two Japanese colleagues, especially Mai Mio and uh, Kobayashi Hisayasu. Uh, who have done very important work on Prajnakara Gupta. I don't think they would follow me in all that I'm saying here today, but I do think that at least for the detailed analysis of Praj uh, Prajnakara Gupta's work and how inference and perception are described, our opinions uh, converge. They work on different parts of the Pratyaksha chapter than what I'm using here. So I said I would show you two examples. Um, the first is the cognition of the linga, uh, of the reason property in the case of, a, of an inference. And this is a discussion uh, that bases itself on the Pratyaksha chapter of the Pramana Vatika on two verses where uh, Dhammakirti essentially asserts that the cognition of a reason property and the cognition of the object which possesses the reason property do not appear in cognitions, but rather they are determined. So they are somehow known in a general way. That means their cognition must be conceptual. <clears throat> 
the example which I'm going to use here throughout is that of the inference, the standard case uh, of fire from smoke on a hill. So the Lingin would be the hill, the Linga would be smoke. So because there is smoke on the hill, you can infer that there is fire on that hill. And the Maggetti tells us here, first of all, that the cognition of the Linga and the Lingin do not appear, uh, sorry, that the Linga and the Lingin as particulars do not appear, but are determined in these kinds of cognitions. So these two elements of an inference. He adds that the cognitions of Linga and Lingin are not belying, they are avanjanam, trustworthy, which is essentially a synonym of avisam vada, now, the first criterion, the positive criterion of Brahmanas. So, uh, Namakirti tells us, essentially, or effectively, that these cognitions are Brahmanas. And the question that arises is, well, then these cognitions should actually be inferences, shouldn't they? Because to be conceptual and to be a pramana in the Amakirti system means to be an inference. Now, there were some objections raised here by uh, opponents, non-Buddhist opponents. And the nice thing is that pramana, uh, Prajnakara Gupta summarizes these for us. And he says that, uh, there were mainly three problems with these verses. First, the Linga Jnana is an inference like the Lingi Jnana, or is inferential uh, like the Lingi Jnana. Then why would you mention them separately? This is a kind of procedural error that uh, Dhammakirti would be um, accused of uh, and was accused of apparently. Then the second is that if the cognition of smoke is a perception, then how can uh, Dharmakirti say that it is abhasa shunya, free of an appearance of the smoke? And the third is that if the linga jnana is an inference, then it must contain its own linga jnana. So an infinite regress starts. The second and third uh, observations or criticisms combine to uh, make a kind of trap or form a kind of trap for Dhammakirti because obviously you want the Linga Jnana or the Lingi Jnana also, but the main debate here is about the Linga Jnana, the cognition of smoke, to be certain, but at the same time, uh, it's not, it can't be a perception according to Dhammakirti's own words here, saying that it's free of an appearance of the smoke. So how does this problem get solved? Prajnakara Gupta refers to a discussion by Damotara, or an answer by Damotara, a solution that Damotara gives to this, and summarizes it as follows. He says that the Linga Jnana, that there is smoke, uh, is analyzed by Damotara as a perception and followed plus its perceptual judgment, which is actually the conceptual formulation. So, his idea, <clears throat> Damotara's idea is essentially to say that the Linga Jnana follows uh, upon a perception of smoke and is as good as perception or um, as strong as perception without actually being a means of a recognition. Uh, and we can exclude uh, that it is a valid means of cognition because of the Grahita Grahana uh, argument but it's not actually a perception because as a perceptual judgment, a small simple cognition that follows upon the perception, it uh, contains an aspect uh, that cannot be conceptual, namely that it uh, presents the smoke and so on as connected in this case to the lingin, but Actually, you need to know various things about smoke so that the cognition of smoke becomes a proper uh, cognition of the reason property, of smoke as a reason property. 
this is the summary of the motorist solution. Now, Prajakaragupta disagrees uh, with this and says that the problem is actually still not solved. If the linga jnana is essentially smarana, so this perceptual uh, judgment which follows, then we can't properly call it avanchaka. We can't really say that it is trustworthy, like the perception that's uh, not permitted to just transfer this pramania, the validity, to the following cognition. Again, the, differenti the reason why Dhammakirti differentiates these two cognitions is not obvious if both of them um, are conceptual cognitions or actually inferences in the case of the Lingi Jnana. Oops. And the third problem uh, is that if you were to try to maintain basically the solution of the motorists and then say that this uh, perceptual judgment, which says there is smoke, uh, is not a pramana because of grahita grahana, <clears throat> then you'd end up with the fact that just the perception before it is the pramana. And again, you would fall back into the problem that Dhammakirti explicitly says that the linga jnana is um, a, not a perception because it's free of the appearance ababasa shunya of the linga, of the smoke. So we need a better solution. And this is what Prajnakaragupta seems to provide here. First of all, he solves the problem uh, of the of why Dhammakirti speaks of the linga and lingi cognitions as separate by referring to the differentiation of two kinds of reasons that uh, Dhammakirti accepts, namely the karya heto and the svabhava heto. And he says that the karya, an inference based on an effect, like in the case of smoke and fire, that in that sort of inference, the cognition of the linga and the lingi are actually not of the same object. And therefore, it's fair to mention them separately. It's good enough for, uh, as a reason for Dhammakirti. Then slightly more interesting for our um, purposes is that he does, he, in this instance, classify Pratyabhijnana, which is his way of expressing or Pratyabhijnana as recognition, is what does what Smarana or Smriti does for in the Motoras model. And uh, Prajnakara Gupta says that this is an inference. Let's just accept it. It has to be, otherwise we'll never get out of this uh, problem that the opponents raised against Dhammakirti. Otherwise inference will never be certain. He says, and he adds, that there is not actually an infinite regress in this case, because under certain circumstances, atyanta vyasat, if there is uh, extreme or strong, um, perfect uh, habituation, Abhyasa, then perceptions can cause activity without another inference. So this is the first time I think we're seeing this Abhyasa notion, which together with Pratyaksha uh, allows Prajnakaragupta to maintain that Pratyaksha causes everyday activity. Vyavahara, which for Prajnakaragupta is activity which is, that is directed at external, extra mental objects. <clears throat> so in the end, uh, Rajnakara Gupta's idea here is that he does not think there is a need for the argument of perceptual judgment coupled to a subsequent exclusion of it as a means of valid cognition. And the model that he proposes to explain inference is then that this one element of inference, um, the cognition of smoke, is that it says Pratyaksha and Abhyasa together uh, <clears throat> allow us to explain the linga jnana without a conceptual cognition that ascertains the linga, the smoke. So essentially, I'm uh, 
Pratyakara Gupta's model. If Pratyaksha is coupled to Abhyasa, we can jump directly to the Lingi Jnana. If Abhyasa is absent, so this is supposed to be a subtraction, uh, then Pratyaksha actually needs a Vikalpa that ascertains the Linga, and this is simply Anumana, because that's the only one, um, Vikalpa that can ascertain things uh, validly, good in, in a form that good enough for another inference. In this sense, I think um, Prajnakara Gupta tries to get around the requirement for Grihita Grahana. Um, <clears throat> the number four is perhaps not so pertinent now. Uh, so this is the end of the first um, step, basically. The results so far, uh, I think, are that, or should be, I hope I've convinced you, is that Grihita Grahana is not systematically relevant for Prajnakara Gupta. We just saw that he can give a good account, or an account at least, uh, of the elements of inference, especially one problematic one, the cognition of smoke, or the reason property, without having to uh, use this reason for excluding a potential ascertainment of the smoke. And we've seen that in order to get there, he needs to posit that perception needs habituation to be a pramana, as far as external objects are concerned, vyavahara karanam. Uh, this is not particularly revolutionary, I would say. Uh, there is a solid basis of, of perceptions that uh, occur together with habits coupled with habituation and which immediately lead to certain um, behavior. This is um, clear in Dhammakirti's work and even Dhammottara uh, accepts this. The point is that Prajnakara Gupta, uh, by refusing to follow Dhammottara on this Grahita Grahana road, has to give more importance to perception plus habituation. So the next questions we should look at is, what the role of habituation actually is here. Um, we saw that it's this requirement uh, for linga jnana when that is done by perception. Uh, and what exactly is the relation of perception and inference? We saw that Prajnakara Gupta thinks he can get out of the circle. There is no another star, no infinite regress. Um, but it's still slightly puzzling because there is, if there is habituation, then the linga jnana can be a perception, but if not, it's an inference. So it would seem that perception and inference can more or less switch places uh, and do things which uh, perhaps it's not obvious, at least it wasn't to me, uh, that usually should not be so easily possible. Uh, okay, so with this, um, I'd like to have a look at the relation of perception, inferences, and habits. Again, this is the second uh, step where I try to show that the model that Prajnakara Gupta tries to establish is quite different from that which Damotra offers, the model being the explanation of everyday activity. Um, Somewhat shockingly, uh, <clears throat> Pratnyakara Gupta asserts that perception needs inference, requires inference, at first, aditahach, in order to cause successful activity, in order to be pravataka. So in order to be a means of valid cognition, that means in order to allow activity aimed at extramental objects, perception actually needs inference. And likewise, tata, uh, inference also needs perception. He does admit that there is a difference uh, by saying that there is a um, usual temporal sequence, namely atra kvachit purvam kvachit param. So sometimes one is earlier, sometimes one is later. And usually this means that first we experience perception, like we see the smoke, and then an inference. Oh, there is fire in the place where the smoke is. 
Uh, but then he has this two parts here, which are slightly uh, problematic, but it seems to say that what we don't usually assume to be the case, naishate, is that inference occurs first and then perception. So the reverse order from the usual temporal sequence. Um, Pratyakara Gupta uh, states this verse pretty deeply in the Pratyaksha chapter, his verse 244 and 5. Uh, but it reflects a programmatic statement that is made at the beginning of the Pratyaksha chapter. And for this, we luckily have a um, critical edition by Inami and many colleagues of his. Uh, so we can read that quite well. There's also a Japanese translation, which I haven't, which I'm not able to read. So if you know Japanese, you might want to look up the translation also. But the basic idea and the, where it reflects the elements from before is that inference uh, does not establish its purpose. This is an opponent speaking. 26 is an opponent speaking and 28 then is the answer by Prajnakara Gupta. So the opponent says that perception uh, needs to be there for inference uh, to establish its purpose. But uh, perception, in fact, can cause activity due to habituation without this inference. As I said, this is a typical idea uh, in um, Dhammakirti, and also the Motra accepts this. Uh, <clears throat> and interestingly, Prajnakara Gupta says that he has in the prose above uh, stated here that without abhyasa, there is no validity for pratyaksha. This is the idea we've seen before uh, and means that pratyaksha would only actually be, for example, in the cognition of smoke, enough to found an inference if there is abhyasa. And therefore, Tato uh, Prajnakara Gupta concludes, inference is the main element there, uh, I think. So in this case, where um, perception uh, has abhyasa. This is, I think, significant because it shows, even though it doesn't give a detailed explanation, uh, that anumana is related to the formation of abhyasa, which uh, provides perception. I think if we ask ourselves how habituation is linked to inference, I think the answer given this verse 28 must be that inference is the main element for establishing uh, abhyasa because in the absence of abhyasa, pratyaksha would not be a pramana. So in a sense, anumana is the main, um, more important of the two pramanas. We have to qualify this statement immediately uh, that inference is the main or stronger of the two by looking at the context of the previous verse actually. So before this explanation at the beginning of the chapter. And here Prajnakara Gupta is telling us that uh, Pratyaksha is indeed a means of valid cognition. Pratyaksha manam vina manena, even without inference, but only insofar as self-awareness is concerned. The idea here, well, then he continues, um, maybe I'll finish this first, is that, so, excuse me, um, Pratyaksha is a means of valid cognition without inference concerning co uh, self-awareness. However, everyday cognition, so the cognition directed at extramental object, uh, activity directed at extramental objects, is not like that. So even if pratyaksha is a means of valid cognition in that sense, with regard to Swavedana or Swasambedana, what of it doesn't really help. He explains that uh, nothing at all would be the case, because uh, if pratyaksha because in the case of pratyaksha, which is just mere self-awareness, 
the object is not established, the external object of activity that is Atta, Atta Aprasiditach, and a beta is not established. Here the beta, let me thank Professor Inami for pointing this out to me at an earlier occasion, is between the cognition and the external, extramental object. Therefore, Prajnakaragupta continues, <clears throat> uh, perception, adhyaksha, cannot establish either the object or this difference between object and cognition without inference. And therefore, perception doesn't have prama, so is not a means of valid cognition, isn't a means of valid cognition without inference. It's in this sense, I think, that the pradana should be understood that we saw before the statement that inference is the uh, stronger one of the two means of valid cognition, insofar as it um, makes uh, perception a pramana for external objects. Excuse me for the typo here in the last line. Uh, so inference really is what throws activity out at extra mental objects, according to Prajnakaragupta. Perception in and of itself would only be directed at self-awareness. So this, I think, is also uh, quite obviously a yoga chara or vijnapti matrata position, the uh, strongly idealist position, and is very much in uh, harmony with the other aspects, many other aspects that we know of Prajnakaragupta's work. In fact, he says, in the case of perception, Advaitam avashishyate, only Advaita, non-duality remains. We have no notion of object and cognition as separate. <clears throat> to add to this, the um, opponent asks, all right, so if I, if I were to admit this, then certainly Anumana could be a means of valid cognition even without pratyaksha. And surprisingly, or to reinforce the mutual dependency between pratyaksha and anumana, Prajnakaragupta denies this and says that inference uh, indicates a fire, so I'm supplying the examples, uh, without revealing the precise place. And it is perception that lets you know the place of the actual fire. The Example that he gives us in the prose following this verse, the Prajnakaragupta mentions, is that of a fire behind a wall and you see the smoke rising up above the wall. Now you can infer that there's fire, but you cannot know where the fire is precisely. And so you have to walk around the wall and see it. Uh, that's a very simplistic, uh, <laughs> Sorry, it's probably due to my interpretation or understanding of this, but this is one case where inference is said by Prajnakaragupta to depend on subsequent perception. There are one or two other cases where he says this, but they are further removed and uh, I might not go into them too much. Uh, we're nearly at the end of the second uh, group of statements, but we should also remind ourselves that uh, for Prajnakaragupta, the object of valid cognition is actually the future particular, both for uh, inference and for perception. This is different. This object that can fulfill a purpose and that you can reach through using a pramana, this external, extramental object, is different from the object that appears uh, to perception. It's present, what is present, directly present to perception is a real thing. Uh, we, if you're in Bahar uh, Vardhan, you would think it's the external real thing that throws its image into cognition, or you just say it's the buddhi akara, and to inference it's definitely the cognition's own form in the present moment. But both are able to direct the activity at a future particular, that's why they are pramanas. But they don't show this object. And in that sense, Prajnakaragupta adds, both are erroneous concerning the object of activity. 
or as he says, sometimes they are bland with regard to the object that they indicate. Uh, <clears throat> the relation, or well, the, the significance for this is that for Prajnakara Gupta, I think uh, inference and perception are very much on an equal footing within the realm of everyday means of valid cognition. Both direct you at something which is not actually present in them. And as I've tried to show, they do this by, or Prajnakara Gupta does this by indicating a kind of circular dependency or mutual dependency at least between inference and perception. And so this brings us mm, to the end of this. Just let me sum up what I think are the main points of Prajnakara Gupta's explanation here of Yavahara, of uh, activity directed at extramental objects. So Pratyaksha is acknowledged by him as a pramana as far as self-awareness is concerned. That's very important for his position as a Yogacharin and also for his uh, general and later very influential theory of Chitra Advaita. But within the realm of everyday activity, Pratyaksha coupled with Abhyasa can indeed function as a pramana for external objects. But if this abhyasa is absent, then you need an anumana. If your activities are to be um, certain and uh, or promise success. So an anumana, as we saw, presupposes a cognition of the linga. And this, as we also saw, can be either pratyaksha, so that in the end inference depends on perception, or it can be itself an anumana. And this again requires linga jnana, etc. So, which again would have one of these two dependencies, up to the point where perception plus abhyasa, so to speak, kick in and cut off the regress. Uh, and my claim, although I haven't uh, argued for this in much detail, is that abhyasa is here constituted through inference, which is essentially based on uh, nescience. Let me just finish with this last uh, small quote where Prajnakara Gupta picks up a formulation from the beginning of his favorite chapter of the Pramana Vatika, the second or the Pramana Siddhi chapter, where Damakirti said, Svarupasya Svatoka Tih Pramaniam Vyavaharina. Uh, that, and Prajnakara Gupta integrates this into his own statement syntactically uh, and says that Damakirti said that in and of itself, uh, cognition knows its own form. 